Welcome to worship this morning. We want to welcome those here in the worship center and those of you watching online. Many of you are new to the MGBC family and we would like to get to know you better. On Sunday, August 15th, we will hold a new attenders open house. We will meet for coffee and donuts at 10 a.m. between the two worship services in the multi-purpose room. Our church staff will be there to answer any questions and to help you better connect with the MGBC family and our ministries. If you would like food boxes to distribute to those in need in the community, today is the final day to sign up. Go to the website and request how many boxes you need. Stop by the church between 10.30 a.m. and 12.30 a.m. this Tuesday, July 27th to pick up your food. If this time does not work for you, we'll make other arrangements for you to obtain your food boxes. Wow, it's a beautiful day here at Camp Manawagon. What do you guys yeah, want to do today? It is. I don't know. Want to go play some basketball? Very right, good. How about rock wall? Rock wall. Let's go. Rock yeah, wall. Yeah. I like swinging, just on the swing. Swinging on the swing? Yeah, yeah that's really nice. Or the sliding board's fun, too. How about foosball? Foosball, yeah, we can go in the gym, play some foosball. Yep. Ping pong. Ping pong. Pool Ping table. Pong. I'll push you on the swing. Wow. You're a great boss. I like Nine Square and Gaga. I like Nine, Nine Square? Square. Yeah. You know, this is way more fun with more people. That's true. That's true. Well, you can join us at the Family Fun Festival here at Camp Manawagon, August 22nd, and you can play all of these games with us. Let's head home. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. That was awesome. Hey, we are really excited for our Family Fun Festival. We hope you can join us, whether you've been part of our church family for a long time, or maybe you're newer and would like to get to know people better. You'll be able to get to know the staff better. It's going to be a great time. You can uh, beat Daryl at some games if you want. No, that didn't really get a good laugh. They must, they, no, Daryl, Daryl will take you down. I think it hit your foot. Did anyone else see it hit Daryl's? I think he cheated. No. All right. It's going to be a great time, though. We'll do a lot of that stuff. Uh, and if you just want to hang out for the day, too, you don't have to play the games. Um, we'll have worship down under a big tent in the ball field. It's going to be an awesome time. So put that on your calendar. You don't want to miss that. Um, we're, we're so thankful you chose to join us for worship this morning, whether you're here in person, maybe you're joining us online. If you're here in person, please stand. Let's read our call to worship together. The call to worship comes from Psalm 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. All right, let's sing. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me praising your name no matter what comes. I can't count the times I've called your name some broken night And you showed up and patched me up like you do every time I get amnesia I forget that you keep coming around Yeah, ain't no way you'll ever let me down Come on, let's sing it Good God Almighty I hope you'll find me Praising your name Tell me, is he good? He is good. Is he God? He is God. He is good God Almighty. You say your love goes on forever, that your mercy never stops. So why would I assume you'll be somebody that you're not? Like sun in the morning, I know you're going to be there every day. So what on earth could make me be afraid? 
them when the sun goes down. Love them in the morning, love them in the noontime. Love them when the sun goes down. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praising your name no matter what comes. Because I know where I'd be without your mercy. So I keep praising your name. So tell me, is he good? He is good. Tell me, is he God? He is God. He is good God Almighty. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus when the sun goes down. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus when the sun goes down. Amen. You can be seated. want to say once again good morning to everyone good morning while wow, we wow audience good participation morning. is low morale probably get coffee for everyone later i'll take one great Thanks, two dear. creams two, uh no i just black that's fine wow that's uh, anyways sure good morning everyone uh, as you can see we are all decked out and ready for vbs this week uh, we would love to have your kids join us starting tomorrow at 6 15 if you haven't pre-registered you can hop on the church website and do that um, we also have VBX for the teens. We do. It's called, everyone asks me, okay, why do we call it VBX? It's Vacation Bible Extreme. Okay, I'm not going to lie. I inherited the name. I'm just trying to work with it. Okay. <laughs> so. And where do you have VBX at? Okay, we're having it in the multi-purpose room. So if you have middle schoolers that come, they need to head over to the multi-purpose room. Everyone else will come in the main lobby and register. Um, we would, am I doing that? Back. Whoever has mic eight, it was mic okay. eight. Um, so we would love to have you come tomorrow night. If you're not able to be a part of Bible school, we'd love to have you praying for our Bible school this week, for our Bible teachers, for the leaders, um, for our kids that are coming. And we have some um, prayer guides sitting on the information table for those who are interested in joining us through prayer this week. Um, as you can tell, we're going to be studying different cultures this week. Our theme is the incredible race, and we're going to learn all about the Tower of Babel and how God separated people groups at the Tower of Babel into different, um, different languages, um, sent them to different places to live, developed different cultures. And so all week we're going to be learning about different cultures. And one of those places we're going to learn about is the Central African Republic. And that's our missions this, this week. We're going to be working with a group called Water for Good. And I think we have a video this time that this we're going to watch. This time, yes, I remember this time. Water for Good is committed to providing lasting access to clean water in one country, the Central African Republic. It is a landlocked and neglected country in the heart of Africa, with one of the most unstable governments and poorest populations in the world. Access to clean water is the first step out of extreme poverty. In order to change lives and share God's love in a tangible way, we enter villages and provide clean water wells. But that alone is not enough. We want to solve this problem for good. Water for Good's well maintenance service is key to a lasting impact in communities. Our local staff regularly provide service visits and repairs throughout the country, visiting hundreds of villages each year to keep the pumps working. Once the clean water is flowing, we turn our time and energy toward the relationships we have built with communities through the service visits. Together we search for ways to develop the village's potential for economic development, which in turn gives the village a way to pay for the long-term maintenance of their pump. By partnering with Water for Good, you'll not only be maintaining clean water sources, but more importantly, you'll be providing communities with the opportunity to learn how to keep that water flowing forever, taking on responsibility for the long-term maintenance costs of their own water. Every day in Central Africa, thousands of people walk right past a broken water pump on their way to fetch unsanitary water. Together, we can end that tragedy. 
So we have a lofty goal this week. We set our goal at $15,000 that we're trying to raise. That will allow us to partner with other groups and complete five community wells, um, which would serve almost 1,500 people in the Central African Republic, which is a great opportunity. And it's a fantastic organization. Um, there's some information at a table in the lobby if you're interested in their organization. And if you would like to contribute to this project, next Sunday when you come in, there will be special buckets sitting next to where you drop off your offering. You can contribute specifically to our VBS project. So that's this week. Next week when you come, on Sunday morning, August 1st, it will be Promotion Sunday. And Promotion Sunday is a big deal here. That's when we move all of our kids up to the next grade. And that starts with infants all the way up through youth. So we will be bumping everybody up next week. So when you come to check in, that means you check into the grade that you'll be going into. So for our kids who are going to be turning three and four by September 1st, they'll now come into the service as part of our preschool worship and then leave with the kids. And our elementary school kids will bump up to the upstairs, so our new kindergartners will move upstairs next Sunday. So parents, just a heads up, next Sunday when you come, your kids will go to a different location. And next Sunday, there's no Sunday school. I know, that's kind of sad. So I just want to let you know, uh, for the month of August, there is no Sunday school uh, taking place here. We give that time. Uh, teachers often, people are vacationing, so there's no Sunday school uh, next month. Uh, but we do have good news for you. On Sunday, August 29th, we are going back to a single service, and that is going to be taking place at 10.15 uh, in the morning. So we just wanted to make you aware of that. Starting uh, Sunday, uh, August 29th, we're going to go back to a single service, and the time that service is going to meet is going to be 10.15. So that's uh, everything we have announcement-wise. So uh, join me in prayer. Uh, dear Father, we thank you for this morning, and thank you that we could... We, we get to be here. We we get to do this. We, we get to worship you. We get to sing how great you are. We, we get to hear how, how you worked uh, in, in the past. And that encourages us how you're going to work in the present in our lives and how we can accompany you uh, in, in your mission. We give this prayer in your son's name. Amen. Please, st please stand as we continue to sing together.
song that last one is declaring truth from God's word and there, there are a lot of references to scripture in that song throughout that bridge a lot of references to Old Testament stories and we don't have uh, time to unpack all of that right now but I'd really encourage you to go to our discipleship site on the church website and click on this week's worship replay um, you'll see some links to all those passages and see where a lot of those lyrics came from and it's just cool to remember that the God of all of those stories is the same God that's living and active now and the one that we serve now. Um, I would like to look at a line in the second verse from that song again really quick. The God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. No matter where we've been or what we're going through, we can't outrun the grace and the mercy of Jesus. Romans 3, 23 through 25 in the New Living Translation says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. So if you're here today, or maybe you're watching online live, maybe you're watching online later in the week, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, it's our prayer that you would come to know him as just that, as your Savior. Now, a lot of us here this morning, a lot of us watching online already trust him as Savior, um, but things happen in life, circumstances happen that pull our focus away from him. So we need that reminder. We can't outrun his mercy and his grace. As we sing this next song, we're going to sing a line that says, Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. Temptations lose their power when you're near. And, and, and God's everywhere. He's always near. Um, but it's, it's our awareness of his presence, our awareness of the Holy Spirit in our lives um, that, that convicts us and moves us away from those temptations and they lose their power. Um, we need God every hour. Let's sing this prayer together. Every hour, most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour, I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior.
desperately need you in our lives working among us we know that we all struggle in this life through the difficult days that we face or through the struggles with temptations with sin and we need your power we need your help to uh, get through those times We're so thankful for the victory that we have through the cross of Christ and through the resurrection that provides us with eternal life and a fulfilled life now and uh, we, we do think of uh, Judy Dilling right now, as I'm sure some were concerned about seeing in the ambulance in the parking lot as uh, Judy was taken to uh, Nason Hospital. And she's alert, and we're thankful for that, but just needs to be checked out. And uh, just ask that you would bless her right now, as well as Joe. And uh, we, we pray for her health, that you would just... Uh, encourage her at this time but it is good to know that she's alert and that um, you watch over us in these times and it was good that she was here at church and had others that could attend to her it's good to be in your house today that we can encourage one another we need each other as well in this walk in this journey we need to be encouraged we, we can't live lives alone we need you just bless our time in your word this morning in Christ's name we pray Amen. Well, you may be seated. It is now time for the kids to head to their worship time. Jerry's with the elementary children, and the preschoolers head over here with Miss Aaron. And uh, appreciate Jerry and Aaron and all their work and and their staff. It, it's exciting to see all the decorations here. Um, let me put these down for one second. But uh, we usually decorate for Christmas, and then we. Decorate for VBS. We used to always wait and have to decorate after church, and it just is too much work to do that. So I'm glad that we're able to have the decorations up for this week. It gets us excited, and many of you will be helping. It's always cool to see the team of people that come and help. I think the adults maybe enjoy it just as much as the kids as we get to catch up and, and talk and, and minister together. So be praying this week for our Vacation Bible School. I know it has greatly impacted my life back in 1978 uh, here at the Vacation Bible School. I came to Christ uh, as my Savior. So it has impacted my personal life, and so I know how that can be for the lives of our kids as well. Well, life has its joys and our excitement about VBS and just our summer activities, but life also has its difficult times. And uh, just this week, I was uh, perusing a little bit on Facebook. I don't always catch everything that people post. I just kind of like to stay in touch with my friends and see what's happening. And uh, two days after uh, my uh, friend posted about her husband, it, I I just was shocked. I was in shock when I read her post, and she was saying about the Lord to sustain her during this time, and I discovered that my best friend uh, in college, who's 51 years old, uh, had a massive heart attack, and he's with the Lord. He loved the Lord. He was, uh, he, he was in ministry to youth and young adults, and he was very dynamic, 
He, he really wasn't into a lot of tradition and some of the things that we do in the church where we don't reach out and we're not always sensitive to the lost. And he was one that just wanted to be with lost people, had a ministry on the, the campus of the Millersville University there, uh, ministering to the students, started a food bank to help needy students who didn't have enough food. And so that's just the type of guy he was. And he has five children, ages 10 to 18. And so just how difficult it's going to be for Vicky now and the family to, to move forward. In a, it's an earthquake event. I mean, some people go through some just really tough things in life that's hard to explain. Some of us go through life and it's not really that difficult at, when, in the big picture. We all go through difficulties, but some people have earthquakes. Some people have big things. Some people go through a lot of big things in life. And so how do we explain that? And sometimes we try to explain it away with trite phrases that really, that doesn't really help much. But you've heard things like bad things happen to good people. Or when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. Or some, sometimes life throws everything at you except the kitchen sink. These quaint phrases really aren't helpful. And they don't really take away the pain and the struggle. Or explain uh, why things happen the way they do. We can't explain everything. I don't think we're supposed to explain when bad things really happen. We shouldn't speak for God. That's something for God to know and to figure out, and we don't always have those answers, and we have to be okay with that. You know, and then sometimes we hear phrases uh, like, this too shall pass. You know, if someone passes away and you were to hear, this too shall pass, that's not very comforting. Sometimes we're not always the most sensitive in those types of situations or every broken crayon still colors or, or just things like that. that and, and we have good intentions and we mean well with phrases like that, but we realize that life is a heartache. And we want to continue today in our study that we began two weeks ago in the life of Joseph, our good friend Joseph from the Old Testament. Joseph uh, went through some just horrendous things in life, difficulties in life. He had a lot of lemons. He had a lot of curveballs. You know, life has a way of throwing curveballs our way. And yet God also blessed him and used him. And he had amazing aspects of his life. But life wasn't easy for Joseph. And he came from a very dysfunctional family, as Pastor Brian reviewed two weeks ago. A family with deceit, jealousy, resentment, and favoritism. And it was a multi-generational problem. We see that Joseph's father, Jacob, tried to trick his own dad and tried to he did steal his birth his brother's birthright he stole Esau's birthright and this dysfunction continues then with Joseph's siblings with his his brothers and we saw that last or 2 weeks ago but despite this dysfunction Joseph rises above the dysfunction of his his family and he is able to be a godly man and he's able to fulfill God's plan for his life and he trusted God. God was faithful, and he, God pulled him through those difficult times. Martin Luther King Jr. said this once in a speech. I really like this quote. He said, only in the darkness can you see the stars. Only in the darkness can you see the stars. It's during the dark times of life that we really see Christ shine through, God shine through, and how we're able to trust him in those dark moments. We feel really bad for Joseph. We should feel bad for him. And we can't make every ex explanation for why he went through what he went through. Why God allowed him to go through such terrible things. I can't explain why you're going through difficult things right now. Some of you in our church have gone through horrible things. Some of you have gone through you know, cancer diagnosis. Or you've lost love, a loved one who was dear to you. Or just many other things that can just happen. Tragic accidents. Earthquake events as I call them in life. And we can't explain all of those things. But we do know that God is faithful. So we pick up where we left off two weeks ago. We want to turn in our Bibles to Genesis 37, 36. 37, 36. We see here that his, Joseph's brothers have sold him into slavery to the Midianites, the Ishmaelites. They're the same people. We just have two different terms for the same individuals on the trading routes there heading to Egypt. But this is what it says. The Midianites had sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. So we pick up with Joseph. Now he's a slave in Egypt. He's purchased by this government official named Potiphar. 
And so we're ready to jump right in. So we turn the page from Genesis 37 to 38, and we're ready to learn more about Joseph. And guess what? It's the chapter nobody talks about, especially in children's church, because it's not, not good for children's church. Joseph is picked up in, ver- in chapter 39, but you have 38 sticking in there. And this was interesting. I was at camp a few weeks ago, uh, at an adventurer camp back in June, and the guys were planning out our Joseph study. We knew we were going to be doing Joseph, but we had to kind of figure out how we were going to break that up, what we were going to cover. And Pastor Brian and Pastor Daryl were there talking, and I guess apparently Daryl said that we ought to give Brant chapter 38. He can deal with Judah and Tamar. And so Daryl comes over to camp, and I'm in the middle of camp. I'm not thinking about the sermon series at the end of July. And he looks at me and says, oh, we gave you the tough passage, and I thought he was just joking with me. So then I come back from camp the next week and start looking at all the materials, and I'm thinking, oh, boy, he really did give me Judah and Tamar. This is a tough chapter, but we're not going to just skip over it because there's a reason why this chapter is stuck right here in the middle. It seems bizarre. It seems strange. You're like, why is this chapter here? There's a purpose. There's a comparison between Jacob, or I'm sorry, Joseph's brothers, and the brother here that's mentioned is Judah, versus Joseph, who was a godly man, who followed God. And that comparison is really important to grab. And if you read a bunch of the biblical commentators, they go into what this is all about but unfortunately we don't usually talk about it in the church much and I I think we should address that so I'm going to give you the PG version of it today if you want to get into it deeper all you have to do is read the chapter and it's pretty eye-opening so now you're intrigued I guess so but please do that after the service today but I'm just going to give you a summary of this of this uh, chapter here uh, this morning we see that uh, Judah lacked moral and spiritual, the spiritual character of Joseph. Judah disobeys God and marries a foreign Canaanite woman. They weren't to marry the Canaanites. They were already warned about this in the Old Testament. But Judah marries this woman. She's unnamed. We know her mother's name, but we don't know her name. That is, I think, really interesting that the Bible doesn't actually even give us her name, even though she's talked about throughout this chapter. I think that is just an indication in Scripture that he wasn't following God's plan for his life and, and going after a foreign woman that he was not supposed to have a relationship with. We see here that Judah has three sons to this unnamed woman. The oldest son is named Ur, and Ur marries a woman named Tamar. So now we're, this is a significant character in, in biblical history, Tamar, this woman. So... Ur is married to Tamar, but Ur is so wicked, God takes his life. And we're not sure what his wickedness was, but he, he, he dies. So Tamar is by herself. And in this society, a widow was destitute. They did not have the provisions that we have in our modern society. So she is all by herself. But God had provision in the law, in the Leverett law, there was provision for the brother of the husband... One of the brothers was to marry the wife of the deceased. Now, that's very strange to us, but that's how it was in biblical culture, in Jewish culture. So, that means the second son should take Tamar to be his wife. So, we come to the second son. His name is Onan. Onan decides that he is not going to take Tamar as his wife. He simply takes Tamar... For his own pleasure, he takes the pleasure of the relationship, but not the responsibility of the husband. And the main thing here, what's so important is, it's absolutely vital that there is an heir. That is huge in Jewish culture, that you have an heir that takes over and and kids so that your line continues. So Judah's line is in danger of disappearing if there isn't an heir. So now Onan doesn't take Tamar and doesn't fulfill his responsibilities. And so he dies because of his sin of not doing what he was supposed to do according to the law. So we come to Judah's third son. His name is Shelah. Shelah, however, is pretty young. So Judah's like, ah, I don't want Tamar to have my young son. And it might be that he was even reluctant because it's like, okay, my other two sons now have died, and now we have Shelah here. You know, I don't really want to see him die, too. This has not been a good pattern, okay? 
So he tells Tamar, you can have my son Shela when he's older. So you're just going to have to make do for a while until my other son is old. Well, when Shela grows up, Judah doesn't fulfill the obligation of the law, and he does not give his third son to Tamar. So this is just a very sad situation. But the story gets even more bizarre and crazy. You see, at one point, Tamar is all alone, and since Judah hasn't fulfilled the law, she decides to take matters into her own hands, and so she comes up with this deceptive plan that she is going to figure out a way to be able to be taken care of by Judah. You see, uh, Tamar is well aware that during the time of sheep shearing, it talks about that in the passage, these men would go out to shear the sheep. Well, it was their Jewish, it was their custom and their culture that when the men were shearing sheep, men would also seek to be with women for their pleasure. And she knows this. So Judah, it says, goes down to his young men where they're shearing sheep. And Tamar decides to, to be deceptive. She dresses up as a Canaanite prostitute, which was very common in, their, in, the, in the Canaanite culture. So she dresses up, pretends to be somebody she's not. Judah is there along the road. She knows he's coming. And so Judah takes Tamar. He doesn't know she's Tamar as a prostitute. And so there are two children that come from this sinful relationship that was not God's will or plan. So what a very messed up situation with Judah and just this choices of sin and and then just how Tamar was deceptive and all of these things. Just, uh, just a really, really sad situation. So what do we, we make of all of this? Well, we realize that Judah sought to thwart God's plan by selling Joseph into slavery. He broke God's command by taking a Canaanite wife, which he wasn't supposed to do. He did not f- f- fulfill his obligation to Tamar. And then he sins by being with Tamar. But what we learn from all of this is God still has a plan. God still has a bigger plan. And even with all the sin in our world, God has a plan that he accomplishes. And what is amazing through all of this, there's two twin sons that come out of this uh, situation. There's Perez and Zerah. And God has a sense of humor because Zerah is the oldest child. Perez is the second child. But we see in this story that the younger son, Perez, is going to become the heir, the descendant of the line of Judah. And so this is, remember, with Jacob, the grandfather, how he tricked Esau, and so the younger serves the, or the older serves the younger. That same thing is now happening with the grandchildren. The dysfunction just keeps happening. But yet God works in all of these situations because what, why is Perez so, you probably never have heard of these guys usually, unless you're just reading through the Bible, and then you're like, I don't know who these people are. But Perez is a descendant, an ancestor of King David and Jesus, the Messiah. That's why Tamar is so significant, because she's in the line of Christ. Isn't that amazing? Then in this horribly crazy, messed up, Jerry Springer type situation, Right, that wasn't in my notes. I was going to stick with my notes because that was a tough section I had to get through, and I got through it almost without making any sarcastic comments. But at any rate, what a messed up situation. God still works. He still works through all the people who just, even sinful non-believers, God can still use them and their descendants or their situation and bring good out of it. God is about redeeming the bizarre and crazy and the sinful. What an amazing story. Realize God's purpose will still be accomplished even though people are unrighteous and disobedient. That doesn't give us permission then just to be disobedient and then say, well, God will take care of it. No, we need to be like Joseph. See, that's what the comparison is. Judah is compared to this godly man of Joseph. We need to be like Joseph, not like Judah. But God redeems good from the bad. No one, no matter what one's past, God can redeem it. So even with the choices that we've made, the temptations that we've fallen into, we'll see here the temptation that Joseph has to deal with with Potiphar's wife. Even if we make poor choices and we fall into sin and temptation, God still redeems us and is able to work in our lives. It's an amazing, amazing thing. So now we turn to to Joseph in Genesis chapter 39. 
Let's read this together. And you're well, many of you are well aware of this story. Genesis 39. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought him from the Ishmaelites who brought, brought him down there. Notice this phrase, and you'll see this again. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And he became a successful man, and he was in the house of the Egyptian master, Potiphar. His master saw that the Lord was with Joseph, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. The Lord was with Joseph. Even in the midst of being sold into slavery, a horrible thing in his life, and we're going to see more earthquake events in his life, but the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord is with you, whatever you're dealing with. Whatever pain you're dealing with, whatever diagnosis you're dealing with, whatever loss that you are experiencing, the Lord is with you. We need to be like Joseph and trust God because he is faithful and he makes sense of what isn't, doesn't make any, any sense. We see here that Potiphar sees the potential in Joseph and he allows him to rise in leadership. He places him in charge of his household and Joseph had impeccable spiritual and moral integrity. What a contrast to his brothers and to Judah that we saw in chapter 38. But realize when life is going well spiritually and just in life everything's going well, it seems like curveballs can come. And that's exactly what happens in verse 6 of Genesis 39. So as we read, read on, let's see this. Now Joseph was, a han- was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in this house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Not just sin against her, but sin or Potiphar, but sin against God. And then she spoke to Joseph day after day. He would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. So every day he was having this temptation. But Joseph was honorable, unlike his brothers. He was faithful, and he would do what God wanted him to do. What an amazing story of a man who wasn't perfect, who had issues too, but who was faithful. No no doubt Joseph was tempted by uh, the woman's advances, but Joseph chose to be godly. We need to choose to be godly when it would be much easier to follow our impulses or our desires. He knew he could not sin against his master Potiphar, but even more, he knew that he could not sin against God. When we choose to yield to temptation and sin, we don't just sin against the person who's involved or ourselves, and that's horrible too, but we sin against a holy God, and that should greatly concern us. That's mentioned in verse 9. He realized the importance of not sinning against God. But as we read on now in Genesis 39, verse 11, it says this. But one day when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were there in the house. And that's, a, you know, that's not a good situation. He's alone now with Potiphar's wife. She caught him by the garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. So he left, he fled, he got out. What great advice for temptation. Leave it, flee it, get out. When we're caught in a situation where we're tempted to sin, instead of just giving in to our impulses, we need to leave, we need to flee, we need to get out. Verse 13. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me. Notice she is blaming now her husband for her wanting to have an affair. That's what we do when we sin and when, when we give in to sin. It's never our fault. It's everybody else's fault. You know, it's Joseph's fault. It's her husband's fault. No, it was her fault. <laughs> it was her fault that she sought to sin. 
See that he has brought him among us, a Hebrew, to laugh at us. And he came into me to lie with me. And I cried out with a loud voice. So she's making a false charge against Joseph. And as soon as he heard that, I lifted up my voice and cried out. And he left his garment beside me and fled and got out. There again. He left, he fled, he got out of the house. Just that is something that we really need to get in our heads. When we're dealing with sin and when we're not in our right mind and Satan is lying to us, when we're being tempted, we need to leave, we need to flee, we need to get out. That is absolutely vital that we put these things into practice. Dr. John Davis, a former professor at Grace Theological Seminary, says this about Joseph. Many believers flee temptation only to wait around the corner for it to catch up with them. Oh, that's a problem. But Joseph's reasons for refusing Potter's wife were too. He wished to be faithful to his master Potiphar who helped him. And even more importantly, Joseph wished to be faithful to God. When we flee but then wait around the corner to sin, we need to realize that we are offending a our God. We need to be faithful to him. We need to be ready to face temptation. So I thought it would be helpful to kind of unpack very quickly just some suggestions on how we face temptation. And a lot of these principles are from the New Testament, and I'm going to give you a couple verses here too. But it's simply this is the pattern that we need to put in our lives to deal with sin in our lives. First off, we need to flee just as Joseph did. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace among those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So we need to flee our sin. We then need to stay away. Don't wait around at the corner. We need to stay away from sin. We need to pray. We need to ask the Lord to help us. We can't do this on our own. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us and to help us. And so we need to pray. Sometimes the best prayer that we can ever pray is simply, Lord, help me. Lord, help me in this situation to do what is right. We need to remember scripture. That's what Jesus did when he was tempted three times by Satan. He always quoted scripture. Why? Because Satan was lying to him. Satan lies to you when you're tempted to sin. We need to know what the truth is, the scripture, and we need to say it. Maybe we even need to say it out loud. Like, no, this is wrong. This is against God's law. I need to stay away from this. Remember scripture. Then seek a friend. We need accountability, and you need to find someone you can trust, and that can be difficult, but it's important that we expose sin. When sin is exposed, it dies. When sin is in secret and it is hidden, it grows and thrives. That's why we need the accountability of others. That's why we need to be in our life groups, why we need to be in our forge and refine groups and in other relationships where we can have that accountability. We need to seek a friend to help us with temptation. And then six, we need to plan for future temptation because one thing is for certain, temptation will keep coming at your heels. It is not going to go away. Romans 13, 14 says this, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. We sang about putting on Christ there in the one song. Just we need him. We need him every hour. We need him to help us fight temptation. We need to put on Christ and put Christ in our life first. We need to replace what is evil, what is wrong, what is sinful with those things that are good. So that's point seven. Replace sinful activity with something that's better and good and makes us thrive spiritually. That's a good pattern for overcoming temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is a familiar passage. It says this, No temptation has overtaken you that which is common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability But with the temptation, he also will provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That's a good promise to know that we can overcome temptation with the Lord's help. After Joseph experiences success from temptation, we would think life would be great for him since he did what was godly. But the opposite is true. There's another earthquake moment because he's falsely charged by Potiphar, Potiphar's wife. And so when Potiphar comes, he throws Joseph in jail. Now, it is likely in this case, a slave probably would have, been mur- would have been killed for the sin, the charge. Even though Joseph was innocent, he probably would have been, um, he would have had the death penalty. But Potter, for we seem, believe he was uh, gracious and merciful by just sending him to prison. But still, just a terrible thing. He was probably in prison, tended 12 years. Many Jewish scholars believe that he was probably there 12 years. One year in Potiphar's house, and then... 12 years from the chronology that, wow, that is just a terrible, horrible thing. 
for someone who was godly and did the right thing. So why in the world? Well, we know the bigger story. We're going to look at that next week, how, how God was working the timing and why he was in prison and how he had to interpret the dreams of the prisoners. But that still doesn't make the bad you know, good. It's still difficult to read that and see that. But we don't see Joseph becoming angry with God. We see him just simply being faithful. I'm sure he had his moments where he was angry, but Joseph was faithful. We know it wasn't good in prison for him. Psalm 105, 18 said, Joseph's feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron. And yet we have no indication that he cursed God or turned away from God, that he was faithful. So despite the situations that we face, God still works in our lives. He has a bigger purpose, a higher story that Pastor Brian talked about last, last week, that higher story, that godly story that God is accomplishing in each of our lives. And we will see that accomplished in Joseph's life as well. So I conclude this. Joseph's life reminds us God's purpose is accomplished through faithfulness in a difficult life. Most of you will experience difficulties, big difficulties in life. But being faithful, God will, he will perfect that purpose that he has in your life to accomplish something much bigger. Instead of pouting, Joseph rose above and chose God, and we would be wise to follow his example. Remember, even faithful Christians are not without disappointment, discouragement, or discomfort in life. Some Christians have falsely believed their relationship with Christ guarantees them an exception from pain and difficulties, but that's just not the case, and we probably are test cases of that as well. We see, however, in this fallen and sinful, cursed world, God still allows us to work through that pain and trust him. It's not his fault. Blame someone else. Blame Satan. Blame the sin-cursed world. But don't blame God because God is simply putting us in the crucible of life. And I, I, I was always fascinated by the crucibles in our science class at Northern Bedford. Uh, we did some things that we shouldn't have done with the Brunson burners and the crucibles when, the, when our teacher wasn't watching. But anyhow, I love doing experiments. I like hands-on learning. And so I'd turn that Brunson burner clear up as high as it would go, even though we weren't supposed to do that. Confessions. I was tempted and I sinned. But at any rate, I love those crucibles and those experiments. But do you know what a crucible is? A crucible is something that it's ceramic and, or a metal container that holds metals and it's subjected to very high temperatures. And the elements react under these extreme conditions and something is created as a result that's brand, in, brand new, something special in, that, in those uh, reactions. That's what God does for us. We are in a crucible of life. We will experience heartache and struggle and, and difficult things. But God is working in this crucible of life to bring about something much better in us, making us better people, making us better Christians, accomplishing better things in other people's lives because of the pain that we have experienced. What is our response in difficult times? We simply need to be faithful like Joseph. I take comfort in Genesis uh, chapter 39, verse 21, it says this, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Isn't that a wonderful verse to hold on to? We need to hold on to this verse too if we're like Joseph and we want to be faithful to God. But the Lord was with Joseph. That phrase keeps showing up. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor. The Lord is with you, Christian. The Lord wants to show you his steadfast love, an undying love. He wants to show you his favor. Let's rest in that, that he takes beautiful things in our dust, and he makes it beautiful. As the band comes forward, and we're going to sing that song, how beautiful things, how he takes our dust and makes it beautiful. I just want to conclude with five challenges to you, just simple challenges. First off, we must take responsibility for our sinful actions in life. Second, we can't blame God for the bad things that happen in this sin-cursed world. Like I said, blame somebody else. It wasn't God's fault. Number three, we need to seek God's help in overcoming the temptations we face. We do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. Number four, we need to do what we know is right, not just what we feel. If we do what we feel on our passions and our sinful desires, we're going to get in trouble. But if we do what is right, what God has told us in his word, then we will overcome the lies of Satan in our lives. And then number five, turn over what we don't understand 
for God to handle. He's big enough to handle all of the questions we have about life that we can't an answer. God is big enough. He's big enough to transform our lives. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity today to worship you and to praise you. Help us to be like Joseph and not like his brothers. Help us to be faithful in overcoming temptations that we face. Help us to know that even when we have messed up, don't allow our past to define us. And we can put that under the blood of Christ and you can make beautiful things out of our dust. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and sing. Beautiful things out of us. 
things you make beautiful things out of the dust you make beautiful things you make beautiful things out of for joining us for worship this morning. As you head home, I'd encourage you to think about that list of seven things that Pastor Brant had on screen about fleeing temptation. Reflect on what, what am I doing well on this list? Uh, and also reflect on what don't I do well on this list? Um, and share that with somebody. Share that with a brother or sister in Christ and build each other up. Uh, if you're looking for that list, you can find it right here on the discipleship link that you see on the screen as well as some other follow-up resources from this morning. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week.